Okay, here we are I, once again with a beautiful day and uh, uh, the pleasure of sitting in the garden, at least that's what I'm doing, um, reading and thinking about and talking about Augustine. So just the pleasure of that is, uh, is what we're after. And thinking about that in uh, rhetorical terms. We will be making our way, particularly in the last uh, class on Augustine, um, the last reading of books 14 and 15, to a more uh, concentrated, hard-nosed uh, reflection on what's going on uh, in, that, in that reading uh, with reference to the idea of the inner word. For now, again, we just want to enjoy the prose. We want to inhabit it. Uh, we don't want to be caught up too much in thinking about uh, words like prove or even uh, argumentation. If we can pull back from that just a little bit to emphasize the rhetoric and uh, enjoy the rhetoric and see uh, what he's doing in and through the rhetoric. That's that's where we want to keep our emphasis. Um, I'd like to uh, note right at the beginning to remind us of something that we can already see in books eight and nine, that Augustine is really interested in the natural world. He's really interested in the phenomena around us. And on the basis of that, he's interested in the phenomenon of knowing which includes the notion of the mind itself now he's going to take pains particularly in these books to distinguish between you know, what the mind is as a you know a little physical object a collection of atoms he's going to talk about at one point um and he's going to spiritualize the mind in some ways but don't lose sight of the notion that the mind for him, like the things in the world that we know, is something that is in some ways knowable as a thing. Uh, so I think that that's going to be helpful to us as we, if we can bear that in mind. We just want to, don't want to see this just as a flight to disembodiment. I don't think that would be accurate or helpful. Okay, uh, all I want to do, uh, all I'm asking you to do is to pick out some examples of uh, Augustine's Augustine's rhetoric, and uh, so I want to I want to look at the opening flourish that he gives us, Book Ten, Chapter One, uh, Part One, or paragraph one or subsection one, whatever you want to call it. Notice that he is returning, he, he jumps in, and at the same time he's returning to something that he has already established. Some of you, in fact, uh, have commented on this already, uh, the notion of the relationship between love and knowledge. And uh, so he's, he's announced this theme as we, we saw last, uh, last time. And he picks it up immediately, and he makes a point with a, with a flourish. So rhetorically, what I find interesting about this is that ability to, to jump in. Uh, it's a little bit like the dramatic beginning of a, um, a murder mystery, for example, or some other kind of novel where you, you hook the reader in with, with something. Again, technique, not just as technique, right? Not just as a trick, not just as manipulation, but certainly uh, that's uh, uh, as, as part of how one gets things done. Um, <clears throat> so he says, first of all, since no one can in any way love a thing that is wholly unknown, we must carefully examine what sort is the love of those who study, that is, of those who do not yet know a branch of knowledge, but are eager to learn it. For even with respect to those things to which the term study is not generally applied, 
love often arises by simply hearing about them. I think that he begins with a paradox. He begins with, there's, there's subtlety here. Um, there is the awareness of something that you can tease apart when you look at it in, in a certain amount of detail. Uh, but he also uh, is touching on uh, the very notion of, of paradox. So he begins with something that fills us, I think, with a bit of desire and introduces perplexity and complication, even at the same time as it announces something that is straightforward, something to which he wants us to readily uh, give our assent, readily to agree with. Uh, so. We notice, we notice that, and I'd like you to think of this rhetoric, or at least I think of this rhetoric, both with a backward glance to uh, a theme and a topic that he has introduced uh, in a previous book, and also I want you to think of it with its forward trajectory, not just to what's going to go on in the rest of this particular book, but it's going to be something that he's not actually going to complete until book 15. And I think it's an open question as to whether or not he completes this topic even then. So rhetorically, you have something going on that's right at hand here. And you also have something where he is uh, sending out a little bit of a, a fishing line and um, uh, putting something into the water and the water is going to take it downstream and we're not quite sure. Uh, where it's where it's going to go. Um, I hope you got a bit of a smile out of one of the one of the next things he does, which is quite self-reflexive, and and for us it can be quite self-reflexive. He says, um, "So I'm still in book ten, chapter one, part one, on page forty-two." It is, however, the prestige of those who praise and teach different subjects that generally stimulates us to learn them. And yet, unless some slight knowledge of a doctrine were impressed upon our mind, we would in no way be enkindled with the desire of learning it. Who, for example, <clears throat> would devote any time or toil to rhetoric if he did not previously know that it is the art of speaking? <laughs> He's He's clever. Uh, I mean, he's we. He's got a lot of balls in the air, and he's not afraid to to use them. So he knows that he's doing something rhetorical, and yet he's inviting us to think about rhetor rhetoric uh, in a distanced way. So there's a both end that's going on here, and we're um, we're being played with. Uh, a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I just thought that we might, might want to notice that, or at least uh, I wanted I want to notice that. And that brings me to uh, the next technique that I see going on early in uh, early in book ten, the way that he performs desire, like. Uh, the the actual phenomenon that he's talking about here is important yeah the relationship between uh we, we already must know something about a thing and that incites our desire to know more about it um he's going to say in a little bit that you know we don't love something that is absolutely unknown to us because it is absolutely unknown to us we don't know anything about it to love it um, so he's he, he's talking in in, in a way, he's talking about what participation actually looks like on the ground, that there's some sort of relationship between these two things, that there must be a sort of a pre-existing condition that we are already in something, we are folded into something. Uh, the 20th century German philosopher Martin Heidegger is going to talk about this in terms of our thrownness, that we're in something before we come to philosophize and before we come to reflect. For a while, this is going to be called existentialism. 
And then people are going to distinguish and say that well, what Heidegger is doing is not just existential, there's something else that's going on here. We don't need to worry about those details, but um, what Heidegger and others come back to in the 20th century is a version of something that, Der uh, sorry, um, Derrida, yes, in the 20th century, but that Augustine uh, already in, in the classical and pre-enlightenment context is doing in his own way. So there's that. Um, and note too that the word study uh, means desire. So the idea of studying something to, to learn it is itself bound up with the notion of desire, leisure, pleasure. This is an opposite. Uh, the word negotiate is actually in its literal sense neg otium. Neg as the negative or the denial of otium, pleasure. Business people negotiate. Arts people study and enjoy rhetoric. So okay, that's just that's just for free. Let's uh, let's look at this example of uh, that theme, the, the relationship between love and knowledge that he's announced. Um, but what I want you to notice is the way that he performs it. So this is still book 10, um, chapter one, section two. So too, if anyone hears an unknown sign, for example, the sound of a word whose meaning he does not know, he desires to know what it is and what idea that sound is intended to convey to his mind. Let us give an example. Suppose someone hears the word tometum and in his ignorance asks what it means. He must for that reason already know that it is a sign, namely that it is not a mere sound, but that it signifies something. Okay, okay. so we'll just, we'll just stop there for a moment. He is, when we think of signs in a nominalistic kind of way, we have the tendency to think of complete detachment. And he's complicating that idea. He, he's saying the fact that you already sense that this set of sounds to matter means something. Like literally, it could just be sounds, right? To matter. But we know somehow that that's not the case. We know that there's more more going on. We don't know what the word means, but we know something about it. That's, that's, that's the point. Now, there's a saying, Iris Murdoch, the 20th century uh, philosopher and uh, novelist, right? She wrote 26 novels, says in one of her novels, in philosophy, if you're not moving at a snail's pace, you're not moving. In other words, to think philosophically means to go slowly. Sometimes I think that for those of us who are maybe, you know, in the arts, in, um, like in literature, we might think that philosophizing is pedantry. And that's something that we're going to have to keep our eyes on uh, a little bit. We might think that he's being pedantic. But there is a beautiful little point in this detail here that the notion of complete detachment, looking at this and thinking about the sign, is not as detached as we might think that it is. That there's something, and this is a German phrase that gets used a, a lot, there's something always already going on. And that's what he's drawing attention to here. So this set of sounds to met him, we know something. We think that it's a sign, and so we pursue the knowledge of that sign. So that's that's one part of it. The other part of it that I want you to notice here is, did you experience frustration? Because he doesn't tell us what tometa means. He just says, suppose someone hears the word tometa, and in his ignorance asks what it means. He must, for that reason, already know that it is a sign, and that it is not a mere sound, but that it signifies something. This word of three syllables is, in other respects, already known, and has impressed its articulated form on his mind through the sense of hearing. What more can be required for his greater knowledge if all the letters and all the spaces of sound are, are already known? Yada, yada, yada. I could keep going, because he keeps going. 
I said that he doesn't give us the meaning of the word tomato. Not yet. But he does give us the meaning of the word tomato eventually, doesn't he? Did you catch that? He gives it to us two pages later. So he says, now turning, this is still chapter one, and it is still section two. He mentions the word tomato two thirds of the way down on page uh, 44. And then in the paragraph at the bottom of that page, he says, for the beauty of this knowledge, through which men's thoughts are mutually made known by the enunciation of significant words, is quickly discerned by almost all rational minds. And because he knows the beauty of this knowledge and loves it because he knows it, he therefore eagerly searches for the unknown word. Therefore, when he hears and learns that wine was called Tometum by the ancients. So even in his context, there is an ancient world. There is a further past. Uh, and he's giving his audience an old word that even they may have forgotten, but it was known and it can be known and it is known to them. This is some sort of sign, the meaning of which I have forgotten or never knew, but I know that it's a sign. So interconnecting the ideas of love and knowledge, he performs that by inciting us with desire. Now, maybe that desire takes the form of frustration. What the hell are you talking about here? I don't know what the word tomatum is. I don't know Latin. Uh, you know, read the room, know your audience. Uh, we, could be, we could be feeling desire is frustration. But even if that's the case, I think we should be able to own, own up to the fact that we've been played and uh, that he has rhetorically uh, enabled us into following him and allowing ourselves to be formed by desire, a desire that is then fulfilled. Um, a few paragraphs after he introduces his little, his little technique. Just while we're on this opening chapter, let me remind you again. We I said last time, but you know, we, we recognize. I think that we're in the presence of a, of a great mind. We may not agree. Uh, we may have issues with uh, some of the techniques that he uses, appeals to authority, and, and and so on. But I just want you to notice his precision uh, in the last uh, paragraph here. So this is ten, one, three. Um, just reading that last paragraph, but lest anyone should propose a more difficult question to us by saying that it is just as impossible to hate what one does not know as it is to love what one does, uh, uh, as, it, as it is to love what one does not know, we will not gainsay the truth of this statement. Nevertheless, this must be understood. When you say he loves to know the unknown, it is not the same as saying he loves the unknown. The first can happen, namely, that one loves to know the unknown, but it is impossible to love the unknown. And all Augustine is doing here is really ta is talking like a good prop. Be accurate, be precise in saying what you mean and in taking care uh, not to make misleading statements. This too is part of rhetoric. Rhetoric does not just mean a flourish. Rhetoric does not just mean saying whatever the hell you want it to mean and I'm simply being emotive, something like that. No, rhetoric can involve precision. We are mindful, we are mindful that rhetoric does not necessarily mean univocity, right? The term that we've introduced here through, through Aristotle, Augustine, has done so in his own way by saying, let us therefore so seek as we were about to find and so find as if we were about to seek. So that finding could seem like university, but if it, if it then incites us to further seeking, there's a recognition here that we don't have something uh, totally figured out, totally in our control, totally available for our manipulation. So the precision doesn't need to imply that kind of mastery, manipulation, and, and, and so on. 
okay, now I've spent a fair bit of time um, in these first few lines, and I see that I'm already at 20 minutes, and I don't want these to go on and on. Uh, but let me uh, let me just say uh, point out a couple of other things that he does. Um, the thinking about uh, Tometa was technically uh, in, involved etymology. I don't think that was the real point of what he was doing there. But he does like etymology, and I'll just give you another example of where he uses uh, etymology, which is uh, exploring the meaning of words. So in ten seven. Uh, 10, he, um, he says, um, <clears throat> gives a little etymology of the word inventio and uh, uh, the notion of discovery, of coming into something. Uh, if I had more time and if we were in class, I'd probably do a little thing on the board where I... Uh, uh, I, I draw out another dimension of the word invencio. Uh, we have the word inventory, and inventory also comes from, from the same root. So invencio can mean discovery. Invencio can also lead us to the idea of simply making a list of things. Both sides are part of what invencio can mean. So for those of us, again, thinking in a modern context who are inclined to think of in, invention as romantic, as creative, um, it, it has other dimensions as well. I guess is drawing attention to that a little bit, and I just thought I would throw that in, the idea of inventory as another sort of aspect uh, that can push us in other directions besides simply thinking about rhetorical invention as creativity. Um, okay, uh, what else should I draw attention to? Right, okay, so in thinking about the mind itself, um, in book 10, chapter eight, and section 11, he talks about the difficulty of thinking about the mind as a thing and what's involved in that. And I'd just like you to be aware of what he's doing here, of raising this issue of what has been called the mind's backward flip, our ability to reflect upon ourselves. Um, again, think of that within a participatory framework. Think of that as that backward flip not necessarily entirely being able to escape ourselves, but that somehow this ability can be thought within a framework of belonging to, not simply of utter detachment. And I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna draw <clears throat> attention to two little footnotes. So one is on this. Uh, on page 52, um, footnote 14, where he mentions the name Descartes, that's sort of the, the editors mention the name Descartes, compare Descartes. So there's a comparison there with Descartes. And the notion is, is that Augustine is rather like Descartes. Um, but notice also, I want to draw your attention to a, uh, another footnote, and that's on book 11. And this is... Uh, at the bottom of page 61. Footnote two, the editors write, in a way the idea expressed here is very Cartesian. That means like, like Descartes. But then they add this, in a way it is anti-Cartesian. Descartes certainly agreed that the mind is not itself perceptible by the senses, but he insisted that the mind has nothing to do with life. That's because Descartes is in some ways a modern thinker and belongs to and is in, in, in kind of um, initiating modernity. And while there are some similarities between Augustine and Descartes, Augustine is doing something rather different. And that context of 
participatory thought always needs to be kept in mind. Okay, uh, let me uh, let me do a couple of other things here. Um, so in that context, you can see like there's a fair amount of rigor again and unsparing self-analysis, and it's part of what makes you know Augustine able to do what he's doing here. Something else that I want you to notice in that context from chapter nine. Uh, so uh, 10, 9, 12, I want you to notice how he introduces, and I'm not saying this is the first time that he's done this, but in this context, he introduces the word believe. And what, he, what he's doing here is he is uh, enlarging the spectrum of what it is that we mean by knowledge. Already he has entwined knowledge with love. Already he has entwined knowledge with the notion of seeking and finding. Uh, and now here he is adding to that the notion of belief. And I want you to go slow here. When he says belief, obviously in a work like De Trinitate and with appealing to the Bible, he's talking about religious belief. Uh, and and so you might think, right, okay, well, that's that. I can just put that to one side or, or, or whatever or gear into that in, in a certain way. <clears throat> but don't go too quickly here because he is going to talk about various kinds of belief. Like, for instance, when we believe what our friends tell us. Uh, do I need an umbrella? No, it's a nice day out there. Um, you know, you can know that experientially, but, you know, when you're inside and your friend has just come from, from, from outside, uh, you trust what they say, uh, or not, uh, but there are degrees of knowing that involve degrees of, of trusting as well. And he is folding that into the discussion uh, of mind. Um, <clears throat> something else that I want you to notice is that uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, some of you may be drawing attention to in, in your journals is I want you to notice that he introduces here the notion of parts of the mind, will, memory, and intellect. And some of you will uh, perhaps comment on this as a trinity, as a form of the trinity. And indeed, that's right. Indeed, it's true that he thinks of the idea of the divine trinity as mirrored in the, the human trinity. We're going to talk about this a little bit more as we, uh, as we go, though. One thing I want you to think about a little bit is, is Augustine inviting us simply to sort of plug and play? Do we have a set of correspondences here? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, will, memory, intellect. If we do, notice how that becomes a kind of symbolism or nominalism. One equals A, two equals B, three equals C. The philosophical term for this is isomorphism. Does that kind of <clears throat> isomorphic thinking, set of correspondences, does that seem to you more like Aristotelian proportionality? Or, which is one form of analogy, or does it seem to you more like multiple collectivosity? Part of thinking about Augustine in a participatory framework is, I think, being wary of one-to-one -one correspondences. Oh, this means that, this means that, right? And uh, there is scope for thinking about that. So just, uh, just something that I want you to keep your, your eye on for now. Um, In that context, he introduces another important idea. This is still uh, 10, 10, 13, where he talks about, uh, he mentions the words enjoy and use. And that, uh, we, we can maybe pursue that in another time too. But what I want you to notice about that is that a lot depends on our attitude towards it. What's our final goal? Is, are we settled here? Do we want to enjoy this? Or do we recognize that this is not the ultimate end and we're supposed to use this because the object of our ultimate enjoyment lies elsewhere? If we're thinking rhetorically about the whole of the De Trinitate, 
the object of enjoyment rhetorically that Augustine is leading up to, he's only going to reveal in book 15. Everything before that is not where he wants us to settle. So the rhetoric is about a kind of use, even though he's not gonna reduce language to a tool, but it's about use relative to the fulfillment of desire, either at the end of the book or beyond the end of the book or something like that. From book 11, I need to finish, don't I? Because I've already been at this for 30 minutes. But in book 11, um, think about book 11, I think, in terms simply of the affirmation of desire and the affirmation of various kinds of bodily phenomena. And notice that in this book, as he's getting further and further into his investigation of mind, that the phenomena that interest him are not disembodied, but they involve our bodily experience in, in, in different ways. Like, for instance, uh, and this one is a little bit, you know, dodgy, I recognize that. But in Book 11, Chapter 4, uh, Section 7, he talks about powerful images. I mean, he, he uses... Uh, he uses a sexual image there, but he talks about how we can have just like images in our mind can have powerful effects on our bodies. So they're rooted in the body, they get taken into the mind, and they have bodily effects. There's still that interest in keeping body and mind uh, together. Or in, um, uh, I'll just use one other one, in Book 11, uh, Chapter 8, Section 6. 15, he talks about distraction, he talks about the phenomenon of distraction when we're listening to someone in a conversation. Uh, and he talks about the phenomenon of distraction when we're reading. When we're actually reading, we've read a page and we, <laughs> we realize, I haven't taken in anything. I was thinking about the game last night or some such thing, right? Um, again, it's a phenomenon. So it's still rooted in our actual physical experience and he's interested in the mind and what the mind is and what's going on in the mind uh, in connection with that, acknowledging that there's something different, there's something unique about the mind that can be investigated in and of itself and that has definitely has spiritual qualities or disembodied qualities. But be careful about it describing too quickly to Augustine a kind of dualism, that he's leaving the body behind, or that he's interested in leaving the body behind. Not likely in a participatory ontological framework. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for your time, and uh, see you again, hopefully on another beautiful time. All right, bye-bye.